Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here at Digital Scotland. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, as Irene has just said, on digital events, but actually I could equally call this digital lifestyle because it's very appropriate to the speakers' uh, points that have been made already. But I'm going to use, by way of illustration, uh, some of the activities around London 2012 as a, perhaps an exemplar for this digital lifestyle, but also some illustration that may help us with uh, the Commonwealth Games here in Glasgow um, in barely 420 days' time. I'll also cover some areas to do with 4G investment, because in case you didn't realize, the total investment in 4G across the UK this year will exceed £5 billion. Typically, O2, part of Telefonica, invests around £500 million a year, but the total investment from all operators, including the spectrum, is it likely to be around £5 billion. And it's very important that Scotland has its share of that. Uh, I'm also proud to be associated not just with O2, part of Telefonica, but also with the IET, where I'm the former president of the IET until last October, and the Mobile Operators Association. So, the slides turn. So what was the opportunity with the London Games? It was very much about meeting the needs of, of spectators, athletes, staff, and in a world where perhaps traditionally they hadn't experienced multimedia from their seats wherever they were. So we actually called these the first multimedia games. And if we just cast our minds back to Beijing in 2008, there were no Apple iPhones or smartphones in Beijing then. There were very little people, uh, the very few people who were taking films or uh, camera shots from their mobile devices back then. But by 2012, things had changed quite dramatically. The penetration of smartphones had already risen dramatically, and many tourists were arriving with them. So the expectation was a lot higher whether it be to do with the mapping to get to the particular venue, whether it be to do with the on-site facilities, or even information and results. The camera capability and the upload speeds were key. But it was also against a backdrop when we were getting newspaper reports, such as uh, Boris Johnson being seen there in uh, September 2011, uh, really commenting on the potential strain that there may be on the mobile networks, given the amount of data interest. And even the week before, uh, a mobile trade magazine, will your mobile phone actually work during the Olympic Games? So we were faced with a kind of suspicious nation. Now, we also knew that the Games were also about transport and security as well as communications. We couldn't do much about the weather, but we certainly could do what we could with regard to communications. So how do we tackle it? So it may seem easy in hindsight, having enjoyed the Games as it was, but there were several of us who were rather worried about it. Personally, I went to the Atlanta Games in 1996. That's a little bit of foresight for you. But in addition to that, I was chairman of the Mobile Data Association between 1998 and 2008. So we already had preparatory groups. So when it came to uh, the announcement that the UK had actually won the Games, we were better prepared than you might imagine. Uh, BT was an early announcee as the lead sponsor for telecommunications. And BT stood as proud in terms of many of the fixed communications, many of the things that they led on. The BBC also had advanced plans, particularly for the broadcasting side, and indeed Ofcom had strong coordination arrangements on things like Spectrum to make sure interference was kept to a minimum. But from an O2 point of view, we were very keen that we built on the Joint Olympics Operator Group facilities where we coordinated what we did within the stadium area, and we also made sure that some of the demand aspects were covered in a kind of mobile experts group, or MEG. On the right-hand side, you'll see the number of venues that we covered, and you'll see it's quite an extensive list. Uh, overall, uh, it was uh, an amazing experience in terms of the range of things we had to, to, to handle. And we actually ring-fenced some £50 million. We didn't expect to get all that back during the Olympics, because you don't get £50 million back that quickly. But it also meant that we weren't in a position to sponsor as well as invest. And I think that's likely to be an issue also for the Commonwealth Games. Some of the areas of coordination were very strong. We were very pleased to have Derek McManus, who's the COO of OTUK and the leading Scotsman uh, supporting our activity. And some of those lessons um, he, he can continue to share after today's presentation. So one of the first things we did was forecasting. And how do we actually anticipate the number of visitors, the sort of movement, the demographics? Clearly not everybody's expected to be stationary. So therefore we were having to handle things like ticket holders, the big screen venues, some of the issues, particularly for re regular visitors to London. We also had to acknowledge that the, the mixture of hotels and venues uh, would change over the period of both the Olympic Games and the Paralympics. So we did not treat it as business as usual. We took examples. Uh, O2 is uh, the lead sponsor for the England rugby team and indeed the Irish rugby team. I'm sorry we don't support Scotland quite as much. 
Uh, but uh, Twickenham happens to be a major rugby venue, and some three years ago, we'd already replanned Twickenham to cope with the increased capacity that had been built into Twickenham over the years. So if you imagine a big stadium with three tiers, so upper stalls, stalls, or cir upper circle, circle and stalls, we actually put antennas on all three levels and then put sectors into different uh, uh, parts of the stadium. So we actually went from four small antennas for the whole stadium to something like 30 large antennas. So that experience in somewhere like Twickenham was extremely useful when it came to designing some of the major stadium venues. In the Athletes' Village, uh, it was one of the most densely populated uh, areas in central London, or east central London, and we put in one of the world's largest femtocell activities. These are very tiny cells uh, that served, there were around 1,200 femtocells in 65 blocks of flats, 2,800 apartments. Now that's world-class radio engineering, the likes of which has never been seen in the Olympics before, and indeed lessons will be taken elsewhere. Very pleased you'll see the reference to the IET, uh, and if you need more details of how we did the Twickenham and some of the issues around femtocells, that's covered in a very strong white paper there. So the scale of the activity was enormous. It, obviously, O2 was a flagship operator, but not the lead sponsor. We covered some two-thirds of the Olympic venues, but we should also just note that the Olympic Park was a, a city the size of somewhere like Leeds or Seville. So in terms of scale, just imagine building something for Leeds and then taking it down. We couldn't take it all down, but we've taken some of it down. The off-park venues, we covered 75% of the off-park venues, and we were very pleased to be the lead provider under BT sponsorship of the Olympic Family Solution, some 153,000 athletes and Olympic family members. We had some uh, tests and trials, if you like, which is uh, a great opportunity. Unfortunately, the wedding of Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, and Catherine Middleton was a little too early in April 2011, but we were able to use the London Marathon in April 2012 with 35,000 runners and hundreds of thousands of spectators as a way in which uh, London could come alive, and other events such as the Chelsea Flower Show, the Diamond Jubilee, and, and Wimbledon itself. The mass events generated huge innovation, and we would expect the Commonwealth Games to also be a spur to innovation and services as more and more people get involved, whether it be to do with small cell planning, logistics, uh, making sure that the networks were running 24 by 7, adding in cells on wheels, or cows as we called them, uh, real-time benchmarking of uh, different sites, and a, a clear mission control approach. In terms of workforce planning, we also did complete uh, everybody work at home type days, so that we could make sure that some of the incidents could be recovered in the event of our building being attacked. And some of that, those workforce planning areas have actually helped us with distance working, with actual uh, helping some of our customers in terms of distance working as well. So what were the outcomes? Some intended, some were unintended. So first of all, I think the celebrations were shared over mobile, as these pictures of Usain Bolt and Tom Daly and Spectator Experience show at the top. People were sharing much more experience from the stadium, saying, I was there, or this is what's just happened, all sorts of things like that. But I think also we were quite surprised when The Guardian published something which said, mobile powers Olympic content revolution. It was much more than networks. It was much more about services. It was much more about the experience and the enjoyment. So I think we're pleased that we did it. Not only were the team uh, Olympic medal winners, uh, Sir Bradley Wiggins, Andy Murray, Mo Farah, some of those great events were celebrated. But when we look at the data, there are certain peaks that you can see there, and I'm sorry if it's rather busy for those of you at the back. The data actually grew five times the projected levels we saw in 2009, so a five times growth rate in terms of data. The actual amount of data that was consumed in the park was 14.5 terabytes. In case you don't know what that is, that's equivalent to reading 14,500 copies of Encyclopedia Britannica in two weeks. That's a lot of reading, but it's also a lot of data. And we carried some 13 million calls in the Olympic Park alone, some huge numbers just for a temporary period. Some of the events that were very popular, clearly uh, the Wimbledon final with Andy Murray and his great success there. Some of the Middle Peaks open golf in the middle of the period and the Bradley Wiggins gold time trial shows there as well as the 100 meter final and the 200 meter final. So certain events drew more attention and that was perhaps because of the success, but also it was just genuinely the traffic demand as seen on the network. So we think we've only just begun in terms of this data journey. And as we go towards the Commonwealth Games, actually it's quite important to just take some key learnings. So what were those? I think the first key learning is working with the government, the organizing committee, the regulator, and the broadcaster was absolutely critical. We couldn't have done it on our own, but actually it was important for the event and legacy. So therefore the Commonwealth Games, it's also important to have that coordination for both the event and legacy. 
because the investment can't just be put in there and ripped out. The investment has to be there with some legacy, with some benefit for the longer term. Secondly, forecasting early what the demand will be. This is quite a complex process, but we certainly did detailed forecasting at least three years beforehand, having seen earlier games in places like Atlanta and Beijing and so on. Trying to, to avoid overcalling the numbers is key because otherwise you waste the investment. Making sure that the skills are there also to match the forecast is key. Not just the base station numbers, but the skills in terms of people. Getting an early start to the stadia design, so the Twickenham example I gave you earlier on is point three. Wi-Fi has become a much more important mix in the equation. So in my, my world of cellular for the last 25 years, it used to be cellular was separate to Wi-Fi. Today we see much more integrated cellular Wi-Fi propositions. And in fact, O2 Wi-Fi today has over 6 million registered users on O2 Wi-Fi. That's public Wi-Fi available to all customers. Build a winning team. Absolutely critical, really, because unless you build it, you don't know what crisis you're going to face. You have to be ready with those skills such that you can handle. And there were a few issues. There weren't any real crises, though. Um, the worst, perhaps, difficulty was uh, at the uh, cycling, the unknowns. We hadn't quite expected some of the scoring systems to be struggling. And as a result, there was a huge load uh, on our network around Box Hill, around the, the cycling. Uh, but despite the unknowns, actually, I don't think it detracted from the experience, just some people's results didn't come through quite as quickly as people would have liked. We also leveraged our opportunities in a slightly different way beyond the network. Many of you may know that uh, the venue called the O2, which O2 is the lead sponsor on, uh, was named the North Greenwich Stadium. We didn't really recognize it as the North Greenwich Stadium, but that's what the Olympic movement called it. So we did some things like climb on an icon, having a, the possibility to climb over the roof, and that, in fact, got a lot of attention for the O2, which is its rightful name and returned to its rightful name. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also made a lot more of the flexible working opportunity, and we found a lot more interest from our customers on that, you know, because we were sharing our digital experiences in a flexible working way. And we also launched a program called Priority Sports, Traditionally, we've had something called Priority Moments, which is about some discounts and loyalty programs, but we added in Priority Sports where some additional discounts were available. And last but not least, innovate at all levels. It wasn't just about innovation around the network. It was innovation around customer care. It was innovation around how we did things. We changed the way uh, forever. So as we look forward, I might jump forward briefly to Rio, but then come back to the Commonwealth Games. I think the road to Sochi and, and the Rio Olympics, Glasgow 2014, and indeed the World Athletic Championships, Rugby World Cups, provide us insight, provide us all with insight that it's about digital experiences. And how do we share those digital experiences, both with the people that run these games and the people that participate in them? We certainly can't compare the data traffic from Beijing to London, but we'd expect as we get towards Rio that the Rio data traffic couldn't be another five to ten times the level that we saw in London, another five to ten times. So making sure the connectivity is there, not just for the broadcasters, but also for the spectators and the people running the games is key. We also couldn't have done it without a great team, multidisciplinary, strong supplier and partner support, some of the suppliers in the room. Certainly the combination of wireless and wireline, O2 and BT, for example, was key, was key because unless the teamwork applies, then the digital experience is going to be much more reduced. So we've already offered our support to Sochi in Russia and also to Rio, where we have some significant businesses under the Telefonica brand, partly called Vivo, partly called Terra, and we would expect to be more involved. But the Rio uh, Games in 2016 perhaps will be the first real 4G Olympic Games. Um, we should also add that we are supporting uh, one of the bidders to be selected for the 2020 Games, whether it be Madrid, Tokyo, or Istanbul. I think from the name of Telefonica, you may guess which one it is. So in terms of bringing 4G to Scotland, the second part of the presentation. Now, clearly, any digital experience is more than one technology alone. But 4G is coming, and it's coming fast here to Scotland. Um, we would say that in the past, the investment we put into the UK as a whole, some 500 million pounds a year, has had a major contribution towards Scotland. But we have had some planning difficulties. So I was very pleased that the reference was made earlier on to planning possible changes that could occur. Also pleased if there is some business uh, relief that's also made available. But at the end of the day, we, we can only get the sites that we can get. And we are uh, therefore doing a few things already in advance of that. So we already have announced that between O2 and Vodafone, we will be doing network sharing. 
So that means you still have a choice, but actually we're building the network together. So what does that mean in terms of, of coverage to Scotland? What it means is that the current O2 numbers of sites, which is around 1,650, will extend to 2,200. That's some one-third of an increase in the number of sites for Scotland. So that's providing additional coverage as well as capacity. But as we roll out 3G and 4G more fully, it means that people in Scotland will be blessed with a blend of O2 and Vodafone's networks combined and can choose to buy services off either company off the combined network. It also helps us en route towards our indoor coverage challenge of 95% uh, of the population of Scotland. Um, the need for roaming I'm not so sure about. I think if, if roaming became an obligation, that could be a disincentive to investment. But I think the combined network sharing, I think, should answer many of the concerns that have been raised already. However, it's not just about coverage, it's also about devices. What we're doing is looking to see how can we bring out lower cost smartphones that will become more inclusive. How can we help with smart metering? How can we help with healthcare devices? I'm part of an industry that ships 1.8 billion devices a year. And because we're part of Telefonica, we have pretty good insight into how devices are going to widen in terms of range. So our partnership with Mozilla to bring in lower cost operating systems will open up development opportunities and applications opportunities. In the applications arena alone, uh, the industry was worth $2.5 billion globally last year, and therefore innovating in the application space is a great opportunity for people in Scotland as well as elsewhere. In terms of innovation, I think we need to find ways of exciting people in every sector about the digital economy. And I would prefer to talk about the digital economy because that conveys all the sectors playing their part. It's not just a network story. Clearly, network is a key part of it, but we need to make sure every sector goes digital. Health, I think, is an extremely good example, uh, but I think education is also a strong one as well. It's also interesting to see how our network sharing principles between O2 and Vodafone are actually based and built on some of our original work we did with Vodafone in the Highlands and Islands some 20 years ago. Our first network sharing arrangement in Europe was up there on GSM. So extending that principle nationally, I think, is a good experience that Scotland's already exported as well. So as we get greater data coverage and more innovation, what we can see is all of the platforms as shown in the middle of this area will, will serve the customer so much better. And it is this vision of devices that can be, offer services anywhere, anytime, any place, with any device that you choose. It's also a question of then saying, how do these sectors uh, go digital? So in terms of education, when we look at some aspects of secondary education, it's hardly gone online at all in the last 50 years. We see examples of this, teaching online. We see some examples of research online. But it's still pretty small scale. So the need for transformation of education becomes as important as the need of the networks. How do we make sure that online resources are used, whether it be for languages internationally, whether it be for history or geography? It's not just about computing and tech in schools. It's much more than that. And 4G opens up much more possibility in that area. Certainly the growth of the internet would suggest that, and the move towards massive uh, online educational facilities should also help. In terms of healthcare, another example there, uh, we've heard, heard a few examples already. We were very pleased to have conducted with NHS Lothian uh, some tablet device type trials where we can actually help people get better access to electronic health records but provide more face time uh, to uh, clinicians uh, between patients and clin clinicians remotely. In fact, on the O2 standout there, we've chosen not to bring in all our experts to this particular event, but there is a FaceTime facility there where you can literally ask an expert about all sorts of questions, whether it be uh, uh, bring your own device type questions or health questions, just through the FaceTime facility on the O2 stand. We're seeing huge growth in machine to machine, and the GSM Association have projected that we could see as many as 20 billion connected devices by 2020, roughly compared to 7 billion globally today. Uh, in terms of 7 billion, we would see more phones being connected than people or more devices being connected by, to pe than people by the end of this year, if we look at it from a subscription count point of view. And lastly, entertainment. Uh, there are several other examples there which I don't have time for, but I just think our experience of, of seeing what happened in the Games, the first multimedia Olympics, starts to illustrate much more in the way of mobile internet access, much more in the way of camera and image upload and map download than we've ever seen before. There are actually 11,000 of our customers, O2 customers, who watch Usain Bolt, watch him live running on mobile TV. So live coverage of that particular famous run. And the amount of data uh, that was carried in the Olympic Park was more than typically we see in a day in Leeds. Uh, however, it's not a city, it was an Olympic Park. 
We also can see huge potential for transformation of business and government. So in terms of why, um, well, certainly productivity in people uh, and processes. How do we actually make sure that access to citizens' information is made available, whether it be from local government or central government? How does social media play a much bigger role with your smartphones accessing information services? How can we actually transform local government more fully? We also see lots of businesses beginning to experiment about how do they access the internet to help their customers with the customer experience. Now, whilst those trends are underway, what we can't forget, I think, is the whole digital experience has to have digital confidence behind it. Uh, we're starting to open up new services where we can offer big data, which we often call dynamic insights, as shown on the top left-hand side there. That's opening up possibilities for retailers to identify footfall by time of day and location. That's not giving out names and addresses of customers, it's aggregating data to help run a service more efficiently, like a retail park. Those sort of services will extend to airports and train stations. We'd expect also that to be a key enabler for smart cities of the future, whether it be to do simple things like informing when the next bus is due to arrive or train due to arrive, or helping remotely to switch off car park lights in a multi-storey car park when no energy is needed. We can also see priority moments and loyalty programs being enabled with new schemes based on information. And uh, over 4,000 of our UK businesses have registered that scheme today. I see why Scotland should be no different to that. Planning this digital world requires some thinking about loyalty and, and rewards as well. We can also see ways of transferring money and alerting people to fraud or debit transactions. We can start to see wallet services that can be available to all customers. But we have to build up trust, because as soon as there are more transactional activities, so it's no longer just voice and text and video, but transactional activities, we have to build up some digital confidence. That digital confidence requires the digital dialogue that was referred to earlier on. And, and to us, that means thinking about not just the capability of the networks, but also the digital literacy in schools, in the public at large, communicating to people in a way that, that is trusted, that's not treated as big brother. It's treated, treated as useful big data. We also, I think, need a new digital transparency where the transparency can actually help deliver these services in a more innovative manner. So just to conclude and then two final announcements to finish. For us, we can see now the road towards ubiquitous connectivity, wireline and wireless, cellular, Wi-Fi and uh, broader band. And that applies to Scotland as much as anywhere else. Providing the demand is there, we can see the investment should follow. But I think we have to also see 4G as a key part of this digital revolution, where mobile internet is part of our daily lives. In itself, mobile internet is not the whole solution, but is certainly a key enabler to digital take-up. What we also see is that there are key opportunities for government and citizens to change the way they do things. It's a transformational change. So we need to be a digitally confident nation. We need digital literacy to be in the mix. We need to build up a new spirit of digital trust. And as such, that transparency is absolutely key to this area. So because of that, we've done two things, and, and we're planning two things that are occurring in the next three months. Um, one thing that we're announcing on the 4th of June is something called Telefonica's Millennial Survey. Uh, we've done a survey of 12,000 18 to 30-year-olds in 27 countries. We've asked 190 questions. We believe it's the largest and most comprehensive digital global study of millennials conducted to date. And we're releasing the results of that on the 4th of June uh, with the Financial Times uh, in London, and then covering that also uh, with the support of the Financial Times with conferences in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in Brussels. What I can't reveal to you today is the full results of the survey, but I can say now that there are certain people who've been interviewed in that survey who've shown the way ahead is digital. It's nothing else but digital. And some of the ways in which parts of Europe have to catch up with other parts of the world applies as much here to Scotland as to other parts of Europe. The other initiative we have is skills related. And I'm pleased that um, my colleague who was involved with running the Olympic Games 402 is uh, supporting me with the launch of Europe's biggest ever campus party. This is a huge hackathon or uh, festival, if you like, of digital skills. Uh, where in the first week in September, we would expect to have some 10,000 campus aeros per day coming in to address challenges to do with competitions and digital skills, uh, whether it be to do with the Raspberry Pi, whether it be to do with Arduino, whether it be to do with games or robotics. We want to really address the skills needs, uh, I think, in one particular way. We ran a similar campus party in Berlin last September with 5,000 a day. 
We think now with the support of the European Commission, we have two commissioners coming, and senior speakers, we can really step up the game. We'll have roughly 600 hours of content, some very senior speakers. Uh, if you want to know more, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, but I just think there's a great opportunity ahead, providing we build that digital literacy, providing we build those skills, then the innovation will come. The networks are on their way already. Let's build on all of those together and make sure we can really build a digital Scotland. Thank you very much.